This is KGW News at Sunrise. A New York grand jury has indicted former President Donald Trump. The exact charges are unknown because the indictment is sealed. But this could have serious political and legal consequences. Plus. I want to start off saying I am sad, I'm terrified, and I'm angry with the gun violence that we have here in Portland that is my community. Community leaders and activists are speaking out after two Portland high school students were killed in a triple homicide last weekend. How they're hoping to curb gun violence in the city and start making change. Well, we're live at the Expo Center this morning for the Portland Swap Meet, which kicks off in just two hours. It's the biggest auto parts swap meet on the West Coast. Six Portland area antique car clubs come to host this event every year. And we'll check back in with photographer Eric Patterson in just a few minutes. Obviously, going to be starting up a little bit later. Welcome yeah. to Friday, guys. We made it. <laughs> woo, I know. Woo. Brenda's off. Drew's off. But we've got the amazing Blair joining us for Happy this Friday. <laughs> trying to stay awake. I know, and Rod, this is like your last Friday yes. before break for yes. you next week. Washington spring break next week. Let's hear it. All right, let's get you to the radar. We have scattered showers, uh, not many of them, but a few, mostly at this hour west of I-5. As you can see, uh, the morning hour is not bad. We will see the number of showers slowly increase, I believe, in the coming hours. But the real wet part of your day will develop this afternoon with all that steady rain we've been talking about and the pouring Friday evening. We're at 46, enough cloud cover to keep temperatures uh, very comfortable overnight. In fact, everybody, for the most part, is 40 or better. We'll be 50 with scattered showers in the metro area at noon. And then we have a good eight hours or so of steady rain that picks up this afternoon and goes through late evening. So with the rain coming down, probably a slow commute back home, it'll be 45 degrees. Much more in our weather, including a winter storm warning for the Cascades and advisories for the Coast Range coming up. Lots to talk about. Thank you, Rod. Former President Donald Trump is expected to appear in court next Tuesday. This after a New York grand jury indicted him on charges surrounding the hush money payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels. It's the first time a former U.S. president has ever faced criminal charges. NBC News' Garrett Hake breaks down what the logistics could be for Trump's surrender in New York. If there's a, if there's a negotiated surrender of Donald Trump coming up from Palm Beach, from presumably LaGuardia or Teterboro or another New York City airport through lower Manhattan to that DA's office, I think you're going to see an unprecedented political circus that'll end with an arraignment process that's much like that that anyone else charged with a crime in New York City would face. He'll be fingerprinted. Uh, he'll have his mugshot taken. He'll have his cheek swabbed for DNA. We won't see any of that, but he'll go through all of it accompanied by his Secret Service detail. And then he'll appear before a judge for an arraignment. Again, that part, just like anyone else you might see in, uh, you know, charged with any particular crime on the island of Manhattan. So it, this is going to be a fairly extraordinary moment legally and politically. That was Garrett Hake reporting. Now, this indictment could have huge political and legal consequences for the former president, especially since it's in the middle of a presidential campaign run for 2024. Right, but could the indictment prevent the former president from taking office again? Our Verify team looked into that question. Former President Donald Trump has just been indicted on charges he illegally concealed hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels, who claimed she had an affair with Trump. An indictment is not a conviction, and the trial is expected to be a long one. But what could it mean for Trump's run at taking back the White House in 2024? Let's verify. Can you be elected president if you've been charged with or convicted of a crime? Our sources are the Constitution and the U.S. Supreme Court. Article 2 of the Constitution lays out three eligibility requirements for becoming president. You have to be a natural-born American citizen, be at least 35 years old, and have been a U.S. resident for at least 14 years. That's it. No other requirements. And the Supreme Court has further ruled that neither Congress nor state legislatures can add new requirements on top of what the Constitution already says. The only way to change the requirements would be a constitutional amendment. So we can verify, yes, you can be elected president if you've been charged with or convicted of a crime. Even someone who's found guilty and sent to prison could still, legally speaking, if elected, run the country from a cell. 
With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. And this morning on the Today Show, one of former president's attorneys is reacting to the indictment. He's telling NBC News that his team will fight the grand jury's vote. That interview is coming up right after sunrise. We need to get up off our butts and work together. You know, Community leaders and activists are coming together to talk about doing everything they can to prevent gun violence. The meeting happened after three young men, two of them high school students, were gunned down in broad daylight last weekend. KGW's Tim Gordon has more on the efforts calling for change. Local pastor Corey Pritchett brought the group together Thursday morning and first acknowledged the reality. Many of our, our community are hurting. And, uh, and I'm hurting, and our, our, our mothers are, are hurting. Hurting over gun violence. 18 homicides in the city already this year, with five in the second half of March alone. Two dead in a shooting at a hotel near the airport, and another shooting last weekend that left three dead near University Park in North Portland, including two teenaged high school students. I want to start off saying I am sad, I'm terrified, and I'm angry with the gun violence that we have here in Portland that is my community. The recent deadly gun violence continues an epidemic that disproportionately affects young black men. This meeting was about announcing some plans to change that and ask others to help. This is a call to come together as a community and to bring healing and peace and to, uh, and to work together to help stop the violence in our community. Pastor Pritchett is the organizer of Better Portland and a couple of upcoming Stop the Violence events. He will have help from community activists like Lori Palmer, whose son was shot in 2015. Palmer's been working to stop the violence ever since. That took her to University Park last Saturday, shortly after the shooting, which ended three young lives. She saw firsthand the human toll. And I've been on gun violence for eight years. Never. Mm. Never seen what I've seen. I felt what I felt. But for this group and all who will join them, this is not the time to stop trying to make a difference. I'm in this community and sitting at this table. I'm on this call because our children and our families' lives are on the line. Tim Gordon, KGW News. That group is holding another online gathering April 4th to get more people involved. Then April 15th, they're planning a Stop the Violence rally at 1 p.m. at Jefferson High School. We have a link with all the details on our website, kgw.com. Now to your morning headlines. There will be queer youth marches in every state today in response to a slew of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation across the U.S. People plan to march in downtown Portland at 2 this afternoon. They'll walk from Tom McCall Waterfront Park to Pioneer Courthouse Square. Marches are also planned at the Hillsboro Civic Center, Corvallis, Bend, Walla Walla, and Medford, as well as Boise, Idaho. While well, helping a pregnant minor get a legal abortion in another state could soon land people in Idaho a prison sentence. On Thursday, the Idaho Senate approved what they're calling the abortion trafficking bill with a 27 to 7 vote. It would make it a crime to help a teen cross the state border without their parents' permission. The bill also makes it illegal to get abortion pills for a minor, as well as recruiting, harboring, or transporting the pregnant minor. It now heads to Governor Brad Little's desk. And a heads up for drivers, today is officially the last day to take those studded tires off your car. The deadline is for both Washington and Oregon. So after today, if you're caught with studded tires in Oregon, the fine is almost $200. And in Washington, the fine is $137. And that's a look at your Friday morning headlines.
Okay, let's quickly check in on March Madness. We are down to the final four for both the men and women's tournaments. Today is the day that we find out what two women's teams will play in Sunday's championship game. Number three, LSU takes on top-seeded Virginia Tech at four o'clock and undefeated top-ranked South Carolina faces number two, Iowa at six o'clock. Iowa's Caitlin Clark has been honored as the AP Player of the Year. That happened yesterday and a really interesting tidbit here. All session tickets for the women's final four were over 300 bucks on StubHub. The men's, in contrast, are going for around $65. The women do have much smaller venues, but they're also, they have more recognizable names in the final four. Now for the men's tournament. Tomorrow, fifth seed San Diego takes on number nine Florida Atlantic at three o'clock and fourth ranked UConn will play fifth seed Miami, Florida at 550. That championship game is Monday. So what I got out of that story was the men are going to have more beer money left over than the women after purchasing their tickets. Yeah, yeah. and this weekend, like decent weather, right? Yeah, to, to be stay like, inside, yeah. watch the yes. game. Yes, I was like, where's she going with that? Yes, to stay inside yeah. is going to be fantastic. <laughs> yes, here's a look at our satellite picture. We're tracking that strong cold front uh, that's coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. So here's the cold air flow behind this band of clouds. The front itself still on track to cross the I-5 corridor somewhere around 10 or 11 o'clock this evening. Scattered showers starting to pick up mainly to the west of uh, Portland and Salem at this hour. And, and it's tough to tell how many showers we will see or not see this morning, but clearly this is the drier part of your day. The rain will become steady this afternoon. Clouds keeping tips up 43 in Eugene, 46 Portland, 43 Astoria. The Dow's uh, above 40 as well. And then uh, we have some freezing temps, but nobody's crazy cold. It's 32 over in Bend and 30 out in Baker City. Here's our future cast movie 1030 this morning. Number of scattered showers starting to increase. Snow level during the day today sits at 3000 feet. Here's the steady rain. Picking up mid afternoon. Here we are at 3 30. Still looks like this evening is just going to be a washout. Very steady rain coming down and steady rain expected for the uh, afternoon commute home as well. So factor that into your plans. There's that snow level hitting the Cascades with heavy snow rates at 3,000 feet. The front comes through before midnight. Then tomorrow it's numerous showers coming and going. Any sun breaks would fuel hail, maybe a rumble of thunder as well. And snow levels tomorrow, 1,500 feet down to 1,200 feet during the day. Here we are later in the day. Heavy showers right there. You see the bright colors feeding in off the Pacific. So what are we talking about rain amounts? Well, just what comes in mainly for that steady rain band this afternoon through tonight. This shows about seven tenths in Portland, almost an inch in Salem, over an inch at the coast. And then we get more heavy showers adding to the rain gauge. Weekend totals popping over two inches at the beach and over an inch here in the Rose City. Our weather models still show pretty close to 30 inches expected at 5,000 feet up on Mount Hood. That shows 28 inches and there will be the, at least the potential that snow will start to stick over the higher coast range highways, Highway 6 and 26 um, overnight tonight into tomorrow morning. And those highways above 1,000 feet could pick up six inches or maybe a little bit more lower elevation of the coast range would pick up some lower accumulation Saturday night and Sunday than those would melt off during the day. So the snow level takes that nose dive from 3000 feet today closer to 500 feet Sunday morning and 500 feet Monday morning for any brief low snow spots. Seven day forecast numbers. Um, the temperature will, will top out midday, maybe as warm as 52, then be rain cooled with the rain this afternoon. We'll be in the 40s, I think, Saturday, Sunday and Monday. Next dry day is Wednesday. There are signs. Stop the presses. There are signs that <laughs> next weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend, we could have temperatures getting close to 70. Now that's a ways out, but it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that dance. You can tell exactly how excited he is. Okay, I am equally excited. Thank you, Rod. So speaking of that spring weather that we could be seeing soon here with the 60s, it is here, which means for a lot of people, it's time for spring cleaning. So we decided to give you a heads up on some hacks to make the tidying up go by a little faster in our six at sunrise. Well, today is the last day of the KTW Great Food Drive. And thanks to your generosity, we've reached our goal of providing 2 million meals to people who need it. Your donations support the Oregon Food Bank and its food distribution network across 21 regional food banks and more than 1,000 partners in Oregon and Southwest Washington. It's not too late to give, though. Just visit KGW.com to donate today. And we want to give a thank you to Rivermark Community Credit Union, Pacific Office Automation, Safeway, and local Toyota dealers for supporting this year's food drive.